America in and of itself was a perfect dream implemented by imperfect men. But the foresight of the Founding Fathers was to understand their innate imperfection and to create a system that was empowered with the mechanics for change. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. The Electoral College is one of the things that it gives the framework for you to have the power to stand up for your rights and your liberties. You've had it for so long, people don't know what it truly means. The actual structure that we have that has allowed us to get here is not the thing that we should want to take down. Now, what's happened? over the years. And while this nation has been tested by war, and it's been tested by recession, and all manner of challenges, I stand before you again tonight, after almost two terms as your president, to tell you I am more optimistic about the future of America than ever before. America was designed to protect individual rights. And getting rid of the Electoral College is the simplest way to make sure that we fall short of our potential. People have gotten stuck on the word democracy, but we are a democratic republic designed to cool the passions of society. That is what the Constitution was designed to do, and by extension, that is what the Electoral College is designed to safeguard. That's also why this experiment we call America has been so effective for so long. I remember when I when I first studied uh, American politics and, and constitutional constitutionalism, the the idea of electoral college is always kind of an outlier. If for no other reason, it's not a college. I mean, you don't actually go there to study. <laughs> um, it doesn't actually exist in the same way. Well, what is this thing? It's it's an odd bird, in 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 the sense of um, it's not an obvious thing. Having said that, it's a quite brilliant creation on, on the part of the founders. After the American Revolution and before the Constitution, you have this period of time where we had a different Constitution called the Articles of Confederation. And this was a really, really simple government. It was basically just a Congress with, with nothing else. And that meant that the states really just did their own thing. The revolution was fought on behalf of self-government in colonial capitals. So if you were from Connecticut, you were fighting the revolution in order to be taxed not from Westminster, but from Hartford. And why was Hartford preferable? Well, because those were people you were electing. Okay, now does that mean that you wanted a government that had input from people who lived in Georgia? No, it did not mean that. In fact, you probably had no conception of people who lived in Georgia. You almost certainly had no contact with people from outside your own region, probably your own state. You'd likely never met anybody who'd been there. You'd never talked to anyone from there. You didn't even know what they sounded like. I mean, we often think that the United States started as a powerful nation. It didn't. It started as 13 feeble states barely knit together by a continental agreement. And all around, the states was the British Empire, and then to the west, across the Mississippi River, the Spanish Empire. The European states had not gone away. They were fully as threatening and present as they had been at any other time. And here were these 13 states making themselves weaker and weaker day by day with the way they argued with each other. And then people realize there's essentially no way that their states can vindicate the rights of people who live there unless they're leagued together. So this doesn't mean that you think, 
uh, if you're in New Jersey, that you want New Yorkers to be involved in anything to do with the government you have. But you need to league with them in fighting this war. But that poses a problem, because a lot of the rhetoric of the revolution is about home rule. And not having excessive government, not having government that's not accountable to you and your neighbors. Why would you be fighting a revolution against distant, unaccountable authority and then trying to create a new distant, unaccountable authority? The founders saw that the democracy that was going on within the states was not doing a good job, in some cases, of protecting individual rights. So when they got together to create the Constitution, this was one of the things they knew they had to do. Although at the beginning, they didn't know quite how they were going to do it but they knew they had to create a government that the power comes from the people, but also a government that couldn't oppress the people. And that was what set them down this road of writing the American Constitution. In order to create a government that would work, the founders of the Constitutional Convention realized that you had to create a federal government that was going to be able to exercise in an effective way three basic functions of government. One is legislating, one is putting that legislation into effect, and the other is judging the laws that are passed by the legislative branch and carried out by the executive branch, and that's the judiciary. The concerns of the founders were premised upon a certain view of human nature. They thought that people were ultimately corrupt or corruptible, and therefore the incentives that operated within a given system would shape their behavior. And so we have this Rube Goldberg device, essentially, that is set up to make it difficult for laws to be enacted willy-nilly. The founders knew based on human history, that the same government that has the power to imprison you or even take your life or take someone else's life should not be able to make decisions quickly. Because through history, often minorities were disadvantaged at the hands of government. At the time the Founding Fathers were drafting the Constitution, they had one principal thought in mind, and that is preserving the liberties of the American people. They were living at a time when there was a lot of tyranny, and to their observation, it came from the fact that the same person or group could both make a law and enforce the law. So the ability to make and enforce the law allows for self-dealing. There's a concern with one's own interests. This goes back to human nature as the founders understood it. If people have the opportunity to exercise power in their favor, it will be a temptation to do so one that may be too difficult to resist. So you create an institution that will prevent this or at least reduce the ability to self-deal. So in order to make sure in the new constitution that no person or group could do both of those things, make the law and enforce the law, they decided to place the lawmaking in one category and the enforcement of the law in another category. Well, separation of powers had not been the norm in history. This was a doctrine that was made popular by Montesquieu and others about the time of the revolution a bit before. And it was the recognition that if you wanted to control power, you couldn't let one person sit in every capacity. They always say absolute power corrupts absolutely, so we divide the power up. There is a misperception out there that the founders were elitists who didn't trust the people. And the reality is they didn't trust anybody. They knew that left to his own devices, the president sometimes will abuse his power. Left to their own devices, the Congress sometimes will abuse its power. Same with the judiciary, the national government versus the state government, the elected officials versus the people who are voting for them. Everybody is subject to this problem of human nature. And the founders set up a system of absolutely nobody is trusted. Everybody is given a little bit of power to check the others, to create accountability. And the founders hoped that in this way they would protect liberty from the imperfections of human nature. Liberty, when you examine what the founders thought about it, meant fundamentally that the citizens of a republic could conduct their business, go their way, and live their lives for the most part unmolested by the power 
and the intervention of the federal government. So what do you do? You take liberty and you protect it from its chief enemy, because the chief threat to liberty is power. Well, what do you do then? You take power and you divide it. You make the different parts and aspects of political power, in effect, quarrel with each other and expend their energy balancing each other. Because when they do that, then they're not going to be a threat to the liberties of the people. So this was the central problem of the Constitutional Convention. How do we empower government and yet curb its excesses of power? What was finally arrived at after long months of debate was the idea of the single president who would have all the responsibility of the executive authority in his hands, but who would also be limited in certain important ways by powers that were distributed to the legislative branch and to the judicial branch. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. What does the president do? The president is there to act now. He doesn't make the law. In the Congress, a slow process is very good. With an executive, a slow process can often be very bad. In a crisis, you may not have time. We need executives who can execute and execute effectively and quickly. The president's not supposed to have very much power over how government works. The president's supposed to make government work. The president's supposed to be in charge of actually getting things done, but not deciding what gets done or what policies are gonna be carried out. That's supposed to be Congress. As Congress has done less and less, the executive has had to do more and more, and it's shifted our political attention to the White House, and uh, you know, it's, it's why we have these big fights over presidential elections. One of the big problems at the Constitutional Convention was deciding how would we select an executive. And they talked about all kinds of things. Should it be a, a multi-person executive, you know, sort of three people, like a triumvirate or something like that? Should it be one person? And how is that person going to be chosen? Some folks thought that it should be people should vote and the executive should be relying on the popular vote. But representatives primarily from smaller states were concerned. They said, well, the bigger states have more population and they'll just rule everything. They went back and forth, small states versus large, the whole summer. And finally, at the end of the summer, behind closed doors in a subcommittee that had been dispatched to wrap up some remaining items, that's where the idea for the Electoral College was generated. And all we really know about it is that one of the delegates later wrote, Mr. Madison took up a pen and paper and he sketched out an idea. And that's what we know. They came back and they presented this Electoral College idea to the full convention. And they tweaked a few things, but they largely accepted the idea that Madison and the other subcommittee members had presented. And that's how we got our Electoral College. To create a separate, independent executive who was independent of the Congress, had his own or her own authority under the Constitution, it was necessary to develop a system of election. What would be the best way to do that? They thought prominent people would be elected by the population in general, and those prominent people would then elect the president. The prominent people became known as electors. A presidential elector is actually a real person. They're elected at the state level. The electors never meet all together nationally. They just meet in their own states. And in December, all they do is vote for president and vice president. Then they go home, never to be heard from again. And in January, we legally know who really is elected president and vice president. And a few weeks later, they're sworn in. <laughs> 
the states began to realize that if the state allocated all its electors to one person, the state would have much more to say about who became president. And so almost all the states then began to require the person who gets the majority of the popular vote in the state would be chosen by the electors, casting all of the votes of that state. The whole electoral college process is a democratic process. It's one person, one vote, right? All the, the democratic principles apply just at the state level. So in a presidential election year, the state Republicans, the state Democrats, maybe the state Libertarians, maybe the state Green Party, they will have a convention and they will nominate people to be their presidential electors. If their party wins that state's presidential election, then their nominees or presidential elector become that state's presidential electors and get to cast those electoral votes for their party's nominee. Mr. President, the certificate of electoral vote of the state of California seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Hillary Clinton of the state of New York received 55 votes for president, and Tim Kaine of the Commonwealth of Virginia received 55 votes for vice president. We don't expect our electors to use their own discretion. In fact, we call those faithless electors, and they're pretty rare. So we do expect our electors, and they pledge indeed, to vote for the person who won overall in the state. So the idea that your vote doesn't count in the Electoral College is strange. Your vote does count. It contributes to whoever wins your state. But really, you wouldn't want it any other way. If you're a California voter, you want the candidate who's most popular in California to get maximum advantage. Similarly, if you live in Wyoming, similarly, if you live in North Dakota. So we have democracy today, but we have 51 democratic elections, not just one. And so they decentralized those votes to recognize that states are different. You can think of the World Series the same way. It's not who gets the most runs in seven games, it's who wins the most games. And the Electoral College, it's who wins, in effect, the most states, not just who gets the most votes in total across the nation. And those are very different systems, but no one says the World Series is undemocratic because, you know, my team got 24 runs in the series and your team got 12, but they won more games. It's just each game becomes its individualized contest. The Electoral College idea reflected the compromises that had already been made in the composition of the legislature. So, of course, in our Congress, we have a Senate with one state, one vote representation, which makes the small states happy. That is what they were used to before we had a constitution at all. It also has a House with one person, one vote representation, which, of course, satisfied the big states because their larger populations would be reflected. The Electoral College reflects the same compromise, and the reason it reflects that compromise is because you have the same number of electors as you have members of Congress. So there is an element of one state, one vote in the Electoral College, but there's also an element of one person, one vote. California still has many more electors than a state like Wyoming or Rhode Island. This system solved a lot of their philosophical problems of a democracy within a republic. It also played the role of kind of breaking up regional factions, which was something they were extremely concerned about, especially at the time of the founding. And it made the presidency representative of all the popular aspects within the federal government, such that the presidency today is the one office, in this case an office that's an individual, that actually represents all the American people as opposed to a particular state or congressional district. So after all this, it's quite ironic that the Electoral College is being attacked as being anti-democratic, when indeed the, very, the creation of Electoral College made executive leadership possible within a democratic republic. And without that, I think the system really wouldn't have worked and actually many of the regional divides we all know about in American history would have probably broken down a long time ago. We have to understand that the Electoral College fundamentally is about federalism, which means it's about the basics of our constitutional system because the Constitution creates a federal union. Federalism fundamentally means that states which have their own sovereignty as states 
agree to act for common purposes in creating an overarching umbrella federal government that will help them do as a collective what is difficult or impossible for them to do as individuals. For instance, states are perfectly competent to design their own educational systems, build their bridges, and designate their state capitals. They are much, much less competent to conduct foreign policy, create armies, and build navies. Far better for a federal government to be responsible for. That is exactly the balance that the federal constitution creates. State governments are independent sovereigns. The federal government cannot tell them what to, what to do. And that's an important way of keeping a check on the power of the federal, or in this case, central government. The federal system we have, I think, works exactly the way the framers designed it and envisioned it to. It's often been said that the states are the laboratories of democracy, and that is very much the case. In Wyoming, in 1892, they let women vote long before anybody else wanted women to vote. Other states soon followed, and this has happened in other ways as well, whether it's abolishing slavery or enacting certain civil rights measures. And if the federal government were left to be in charge, we would basically be waiting for 50 sets of representatives and senators to all simultaneously come to the same revolutionary way of thinking and to enact some of these measures. Whereas when you can rely on a smaller subset, one state or one region or a group of states to have these new ideas, it's easier to get the ball rolling. Our states pre-exist the Constitution. They were colonies and then they were sovereign states and they remain sovereign states. And the Electoral College is what pulls them together in order to elect a chief executive that is over all of them protecting and making sure that the smaller members of the Federation, of the Federal Union, are not simply overwhelmed and ignored by the popular vote nationwide. It's that federalism which the Electoral College is the premier example of in our constitutional system. If we begin to tamper with the Electoral College, what we're really starting to do is to dismantle the federal system. And when that happens, then we're kissing goodbye to all the possibilities that federalism has represented. Greater democracy, greater participation, and greater liberty. One other historical benefit we can see of federalism lies in the fact that eventually, after the Constitutional Convention, one by one, northern states take action in their own legislatures to abolish slavery. If there hadn't been federalism, if the states hadn't had the option and the authority to make that kind of decision for themselves, you would never have had the development of a free North, and a free North which, in time to come, would be able to stand up against the aggressions of what became known as the slave power. We would not have had the leverage necessary towards the final abolition of slavery without those individual federalized distinctions and decisions made by individual state legislators. We also, as we sort of grow up in this country and we vote in all sorts of uh, lesser elections, the principle of majority rule uh, seems to prevail in virtually every other election. I don't understand why, at this point in time, we continue to adhere to a system that, again, undermines, in my view, the principle of political e equality and simply doesn't follow the straightforward logic of majority rule. The trouble with the word democracy is it means lots of different things to lots of different people. When the founders talked about democracy, they thought of a bunch of people getting together and voting on stuff. When people talk about it today, they often use it for what founders would have talked about as a republic. So when the founders were creating our country, they had several examples to look back to in the past of places where the public ruled. And those places were primarily in antiquity, Greece. And there, the public ruled directly by making decisions collectively of course, that was impossible in an extended republic like ours. 
to bring all of the American citizens together, even at that early stage. So they understood that we needed a Republican form of government. And what they meant by that was a representative form of government, where the will of the people is translated through elected officers. They wanted the public will to be refined and enlarged through our representatives. They not only thought a democracy would be impossible in this extended republic, but also unwise. I mean, ultimately, you have to decide, do you value democracy or do you value individual rights? And so it's always majority rule, minority right. If everything is simply 51%, then that gives me an interest to just get my 51%, make that as less diverse as possible so that I can actually govern and ignore you 49% of everybody else. The notion that the country is ruled by the majority is a fiction. The biggest problem that the framers had to deal with was the difficulty that basically we don't all get along in the sense that we have different interests. Once people have liberty, they will tend to fragment. And that's the problem. The question is, what do you do about them? And there are two ways to deal with it. One, you try to get rid of them, which they do in tyrannical countries, despotic countries, or you adopt the solution that our framers adopted, and that was you divide and conquer. What you make sure is that you have many factions, not just a majority faction and a minority faction. When you say 50% plus one, you're referring to one big faction versus everybody else. But in this country, we have many, many factions. We try to multiply the factions. And the more we get, the less powerful any one is. These are all very carefully crafted checks and balances that establish the idea that the majority generally should get its way in a number of areas, but we are going to have mechanisms that from time to time are going to frustrate the majority. We see that in Supreme Court rulings from time to time. We see that when the Senate is able to block legislation. Occasionally we see it in the election of the president. The majority generally gets its way in our federal republic, but not always. The Constitution does not establish a democracy. The Constitution is about establishing self-government in a way that protects individual rights, which oftentimes is directly at odds with democracy. If what the majority of the people want in some particular moment is to interfere with the rights of a minority. Well, the Constitution was set up to have varying degrees of the democratic process show up in different places. Most obviously, the election of the House but also you see this in the delegation of power to state legislatures all through the Constitution, where the state legislatures can decide how to elect the electors, how to run an election, how to manage their own affairs. So the founders have a lot of democracy, if you will, in the election of the House, and they have little bits of democracy elsewhere, but it's also balanced with minority rights, and that's what makes the Constitution such a brilliant document. Abraham Lincoln, had to deal in 1858 with an opponent in the form of Stephen A. Douglas. Stephen A. Douglas was a firm believer in democracy. He was so firm a believer that he had believed that it was up to every citizen in every territory or every state to cast a majority vote for whether they wanted to have slavery or not slavery. He didn't inquire into the morality of slavery. He simply said that if a majority of the people in a given territory or a given state wanted to have slavery, then they could have it if that majority voted in favor of it. No further questions asked. For him, democracy was an end in itself. That's all you needed to ask. What did the majority want? In modern democracies, we sometimes talk a little carelessly in the tones of Stephen A. Douglas that what matters is whether a 51% majority has endorsed something. And that is true up to a point. But there is a circle that is drawn around a set of rights, rights that Jefferson talks about, rights that are articulated in the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. So we recognize that even in a democratic system, there are certain non-negotiables 
that majorities cannot pass on. But we've been told that, well, as long as it's democratic, it's fine. That's a terrible idea. The most undemocratic part of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. I mean, the Bill of Rights is flatly anti-democracy because the Bill of Rights says, we don't care how big your majority is, you can't establish a national church. We don't care how big your majority is, you can't outlaw the press. We don't care how big your majority is, you can't turn to a private group that wants to influence politics and say, we're gonna outlaw you meeting together. And these things will always be in conflict. Every American has to decide, do we value democracy more or do we value individual rights more? Historically, the answer in our Constitution is, we value individual rights more than democracy. Democracy is a great process, but it's a process. It's not a purpose. Talk is again turning to the final deciders, the members of the Electoral College. After Hillary Clinton won the popular vote but lost the Electoral College vote to Donald Trump, there were new calls to abolish the constitutionally mandated system. Before the founding, most people believed that democracies could only be executed at a very small scale, that is to say a city-state. But our founders had a different notion. They thought not only could you have a republic, a representative form of government in this large nation, but in fact that republic would be better. And the reason it would be better was because if you enlarge the scope of the people within a government, those people have to form coalitions in order to govern. And there's rarely going to be an instance where 50% or 51% of the public feel the same way across every issue. That is to say, they have the same religion, the same vocation, the same fashion. You're rarely to have a group that's that monolithic across the entirety of this extended republic. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to make coalitions with people about which you agree on a certain issue, but not perhaps on all issues. And in that way, everyone governs a bit. Everyone has a chance to be heard on the issues that are most important, most salient to them. Thank you. Well, it's no secret I'm here today to announce that I'm running for President of the United States. But one of the things that probably they didn't even fully anticipate was that the Electoral College would force you as a presidential candidate to have to put together a national coalition. You couldn't do it winning one popular state or a sectional candidate or a special interest candidate. You had to bring together diverse groups. You may be unified by a certain principle, but on other issues, you may not be so much together on. Culturally, you may not like each other, but it was a system that allowed for political competition, but doing so in a way in which you tried to bring people together rather than trying to find ways of dividing and inflaming passions. So what the Electoral College does, it forces everyone to make sure that they make the rounds, not just to middle America, not just to the financiers of the world in New York, not just Tinseltown in California, to make sure that they make the rounds going to all the states, all of America, to bring their unified message. The presidential vote is not one big thing. It's broken into pieces. And how you put those pieces together, like a puzzle, is how the president creates a governing consensus. The Democrats are a going concern in the most Republican states, in Oklahoma, in Wyoming. The Republicans have campaign offices in political organizations in California, in Vermont. This is part of the Electoral College driving the parties to constantly be probing, can we pull this state or that state into our coalition? We hear this talk every four years about expanding the map. That's Electoral College lingo, right? Expanding the map means reaching out, winning people over, building a bigger coalition. Expanding the map is an inherently good thing that comes directly from the Electoral College. Without the Electoral College, the presidency would be decided in Boston, New York, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. That's where the game would be without the Electoral College. Instead of that, you have candidates for president going all over the country and not just going to urban cores, 
politics are local. So the Electoral College brings a national campaign to the local community. Candidates have to be careful about how they allocate their time and resources because it is unproductive to spend too much time in one part of the country or in one big city. So over and over again throughout history, presidential candidates who have tried to overly focus on one type of voter have failed. The Electoral College does not reward that. On the flip side, if we had a national popular vote system, we would suddenly find that that strategy became very productive because it's easier to go spend a bunch of time racking up votes among voters that already want to vote for you. You can imagine a Democrat running out to Los Angeles or San Francisco and promising the environmental lobby anything they want because if you can get 100% of California voters behind you, that's way better than getting 50.01% of voters behind you. Likewise, you can see Republicans running out to Houston and Dallas and promising the oil interests anything they want. You're now just chasing a few ideas and policies in the most populated areas. Obviously, in a system without the Electoral College, you're now gonna start promising positions of power in the bureaucracy in DC to whatever locations get that president the national popular vote majority that he needs. So can you imagine having a system where the EPA director is always going to go to Los Angeles County because Los Angeles County is always going to deliver 10 million votes. Whoever wins that national popular vote is going to be incentivized to distribute the winnings, if you will, and the strings of power to those few localities that have resulted in him winning. Help make history and volunteer because this race is going to be won on the ground. And it's going to be won in Colorado and in Iowa and North Carolina and Michigan and Florida and Pennsylvania. And then we're going to the White House. Howard Dean took over the DNC. And his big push was a 50 state model where he was going to focus on party building in each of the 50 states. Now, granted, Democrats didn't start competing closely in Texas or Georgia right away, but they are now. And I think that's attributable to Howard Dean really recognizing in a way that other people didn't, that a 50 state model works and that a party that competes across all of the 50 states and puts more states in play wins more. My name is Stacey Abrams and I intend to be the next governor of Georgia. If you look at Georgia and Texas and how close those races are becoming, I think you can trace that back to the party building that was done at that time. And I think the Republicans should play catch up now and focus on building up the party apparatus and, and blue states. And honestly, Trump was the first candidate that took the upper Midwest seriously. And it's because he had better data. The better data becomes, the more clear it will be that more states are in play because you have a sense that, oh, these people are not as won over by the party that's been winning that state as you might suspect. So I think more states are gonna come online. And I think 2016 was evidence of that. Without the Electoral College, the Democratic Party would be really tempted to ignore a lot of Americans. That would be terrible for Democrats who live in places, frankly, like Vermont, right? I mean, I think this is why Howard Dean talked about a 50-state strategy, because Howard Dean did not want his Democrats to be left behind by the New York Democrats, the LA Democrats, the Chicago Democrats. The Electoral College, in a way, is more important to the Democratic Party than to anybody else because it forces them not to become so insular, so urban-centric, that they ignore the rest of the country. We're still an extraordinarily diverse country, so it's important for our system of selecting the president to represent that diversity, and in fact, to force candidates for office to experience that diversity firsthand. That's exactly what our Electoral College does, by in a way forcing presidents to go out every and each region of the country to fight out the election in these swing states, which we've been fortunate in every election to have many of them spread across the country. It's good for America if the Democrats have a 50-state strategy, and it's good for America if the Republicans have a 50-state strategy. If we start ignoring people and writing off huge swaths of the country, we are destroying our country. America is not a one-size-fits-all, right? We have different values, different thoughts, different beliefs. That's why we have a system of government 
where one political party can win in one year, and four years later, it could be a different political party. You can't win the presidency without urban voters. You can't win the presidency without rural voters. You can't win the presidency without minorities of every stripe. You can't win the Electoral College without that. If you throw that off and you just have one national vote, all you need to do is win one more vote than the next person. One of the keys to the Electoral College's success is we get competitive elections. So Barack Obama can win the Electoral College and Donald Trump can win the Electoral College. And George Bush can win the Electoral College and Bill Clinton can win the Electoral College. That's something pretty cool about that. Right now, 8 p.m. on the East Coast, Connecticut, seven electoral votes. The president, Delaware, the president will take three electoral votes. The District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., and it's three electoral votes. His home state of Illinois, a big prize, 20 electoral votes. The president also will take Maryland, and it's 10 electoral votes. In Massachusetts, the home state of, uh, of Mitt Romney, all 11 electoral votes. In Maine, three of the four electoral votes. Rhode Island, all four electoral votes. So you have to be more than a narrow candidate. That's fine in a congressional election or a state election, but nationally in a country like this, which is a continental nation, the Electoral College ensures as much as possible that you put together a national coalition. Another way that the Electoral College works in the direction of conferring legitimacy is the way that it sustains the two-party system. We have had a two-party system since the 1790s. People in the Constitutional Convention hadn't envisioned a party system, but the party system did come into existence. One major reason that it comes into existence is the Electoral College. Now, sometimes we have had third-party candidates, there have been occasions which we have even had a fourth party candidate, maybe even a fifth. They tend to be very narrow, single issue kinds of events, and they're often quite ephemeral because they're built around personalities. The assumption, I think, is once you eliminate the Electoral College, that we will continue to have two parties. And so that will mean that everyone who's the nominee of one of the major parties will come very close to getting a majority, if not a majority, at least very close to a majority. But that's not true, because once you eliminate the usefulness of the Electoral College, if you go to a system where it's just the popular vote, you could have 12, 15, 20 parties. To get the majority in the Electoral College, you need to concentrate people's votes behind a limited number of candidates. You can't really elect a candidate president who only brings in about 15 or 20 percent of the popular vote in the states. If you have a direct popular vote in which the person just gets the most votes wins and no, doesn't have to have a majority, just more than anybody else, this will encourage candidates to stay in the race as long as they think there's any chance they can be the one with the most votes. If you're in a multi-candidate, a direct popular vote, and you're running third with, say, 24%, and the person in second has 28, and the person in first has 30, maybe you can catch them. Everybody stays in the race, and you end up actually not getting a clear popular winner. Because once you eliminate the usefulness of the Electoral College, what happens is that everyone will get into the game. We will have a lot of people running for the pro-immigration party and the anti-immigration party and the pro-choice and the pro-life parties. In fact, it'd be entirely possible that no one would even come close when the outcome comes. And let's assume that in the end, a person who is in the pro-life parties gets 23% of the vote, and that happens to be the highest percentage of anyone running. Well, then the voters in New York and California and Illinois and Wisconsin who voted for someone else entirely would find that they've elected a president who is pro-life. We would elect a president on the basis of someone who comes with, in with 25% of the vote over the candidates who came in with 24% and 23%. Don't you think the people that got the 24 and the 23 would make a great deal of grief about a margin that narrow? Don't you think that would cut into the legitimacy of the candidate with 25%, of course it would. It would destabilize the entire process of governing. 
The two-party systems actually helps to bind the nation together because if you have Democrats in Maine and Democrats in Minnesota and Democrats in Oregon, they're still all Democrats and they communicate with each other and they support a common set of candidates. Republicans in Florida, Republicans in Oklahoma, Republicans in Michigan may all be in those different states, but they're all lined up behind a common platform and common candidates. And what this does, it tamps down divisions within a nation and makes us realize that although we may be from Michigan or Oklahoma or Oregon, fundamentally when we act politically, we're acting as Americans. And that's an important glue for our national unity. With the electoral college system, if you want to get elected, you want to attract a broad spectrum of the American people. So that keeps people who have very extreme views out of the presidential race. If you can win the presidential race with just 25% of the vote, then the kind of extremist candidates that we don't want to have running the country might be able to win the presidential election. Without the Electoral College, there's no longer any motivation to compromise. The attitude becomes, my 18% beat your 17%, so I really don't care what you think. And what you see in those situations is extremists tend to be rewarded because they no longer have to tone down, they no longer have to work with others. And so extreme positions can have a lot more influence on the process. We have a bifurcated system. There is a left and the right in the country. But within the left and within the right, we also have a variety of different positions. This big tent approach to American politics is extremely important because it's not just diversity, it's also a concern with avoiding extreme politics. And so as some scholars have called it, the dangerous factions that could develop if appeals to extremism were allowed to be made in terms of making a successful run for the presidency. And so one of the virtues is not only the reduction in the number of candidates, but what that does is it forces the candidates to make broad brush appeals to satisfy a variety of sometimes conflicting interests and constituencies. Even when you have one party which scores a complete sweep in an election, wins the White House, wins the Senate, wins the House of Representatives, what you have afterwards is not a single monochrome point of view. What you have is the victory of a national coalition. What you have to have is a party then which starts talking within itself and saying, all right, we're going to govern it all. We've got to arrive at some averages here. The two-party system mandates that they start shaving off the extremes and come down to the averages. They come down to the averages because they're a two-party system and they're a two-party system in very large measure because the Electoral College pushes us, nudges us in that direction. And a mainstream appears. And what you get then is a stable democracy. Here's what people seem to not understand. The world that will exist in a post-electoral college America are five billionaires and a bunch of multi-millionaires running for president, trying to be as extreme as necessary without alienating enough people so that they can get a small sliver of the tranche of voters necessary to get elected president of the United States. That's where one candidate who can significantly outspend the other candidates could really make a difference in being able to win an election, particularly because these days, a very large percentage of the American people live in a very small number of media markets. And that is where having a lot of money, being able to buy media in the big, dense urban cities could really make the difference in changing the results of a presidential election. I don't think that um, big money ought to be able to buy our elections. And that's true whether we're talking about billionaires or corporate executives that fund PACs. 
or big lobbyists. Tonight, we say to Michael Bloomberg and other billionaires, sorry, you ain't going to buy this election. And what the Electoral College does is the last fortress, if you will, to hold back individuals that think that they can come in and buy our republic, buy our vote. So the billionaires of the world certainly have the resources individually to run that can make it much easier for a candidate to create the staff and the advertising revenue that would allow them to have greater success on a national popular vote scale than they do on the national scale we have now where you have to appeal to different state constituencies. Michael Bloomberg says he is ready to run, but he plans to skip the first four 2020 Democratic contest. That's a risky strategy. If you really analyze somebody like Mike Bloomberg, who's a billionaire, man, it's $55 billion. He can spend $5 billion and not blink. But he can't buy the election because he has to be able to win the primary because that's the only way he's going to have a viable chance. And the reason that's the only way he's going to have a viable chance is because, wait for it, the Electoral College. Right? So when you have a scenario where you have removed the Electoral College, now he no longer has to even engage in the primary process. He can simply go directly to the general election and talk about how do I get the most amount of votes that get me to the place where I need to be. It's not about a majority. It's about finding a way to game the system in a way that allows his voice and his money to speak the loudest. He spent over $500 million. That was just on TV and radio ads alone. You add in the digital ads, you add in the staff, the offices, the million dollar couches. The total is likely well over $600 million, making it far and away the most expensive self financed campaign ever in U.S. politics. He spent more than twice the combined totals of Trump, Sanders, Buttigieg, Warren, and Biden. His spending worked out to $7 million a day since he announced that run in November, or just under $300,000 per hour. If your concern is money in politics, then getting rid of the Electoral College doesn't diminish um, the impact of money in politics. It amplifies it in ways you cannot even begin to comprehend. The certified result in the presidential race in Florida is as follows. Governor George W. Bush, 2,912,790. Vice President Al Gore, 2,912,253. Accordingly, accordingly, on behalf of the State Elections Canvassing Commission, and in accordance with the laws of the state of Florida, I hereby declare Governor George W. Bush the winner of Florida's 25 electoral votes for the President of the United States. I think we all remember seeing those pictures of the vote recount, of the hanging, dimple, pimple, pregnant, swinging chads, and seeing all the different cases in the counties. But the interesting thing is, as bad as that was, as much as the entire nation was holding its breath and waiting to see what happened, as many lawsuits as there were, that was really just about one important state. If we had had a national popular vote system in place, rather than having a chaotic, contentious recount in Florida, we would have had a contentious, chaotic recount in every state in the country. Once you have more potential for recounts, you also have the potential for greater fraud. And so efforts on a national popular vote to encourage fraud would certainly be incentivized because it would potentially be more difficult to reveal the fraud on the national scale. And the easiest place for fraud to be committed is in jurisdictions that are controlled by one party. Because the other party isn't there to have poll watchers, to have poll workers, to basically have a system where the two parties are keeping an eagle eye on each other. And unfortunately, with the national popular vote system, it would be an incentive to commit fraud and try to change the outcome of elections. You'd need tens of thousands of agents at each polling place. You could say, well, I live in Philadelphia. And you could go to Wilmington, Delaware and say, I live in Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> 
You couldn't have polls close at different times. You'd have to have them uniform as they do in Canada and in Europe because they don't want early voting in one part of the section of the country influencing another part of the section. The 50 states have very different rules. Half of them require a driver's license to vote, half don't. Some have mail-in ballots and some don't. Some allow for early voting and others don't. Some go from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Others go from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., etc. We would have all kinds of equal protection problems because we'd have different rules. You would have to figure out how are we going to run that election. And I think that means you would have to have a single national standard by which everybody votes. Now that may sound fairly attractive, why not? Until again you consider that this is a very large, enormous country with great geographic differences between different states, different demographics and so on. What makes sense for one state doesn't make sense for every other. And then you would have to have much more control by the federal government. Ah controlled by the federal government, eliminating the involvement of the states. Now, you would have accomplished exactly what the framers tried to avoid. You would put control in one place. And how are you gonna stop the corruption there? Whichever party it is. Without the Electoral College, the federal government would have to take more control over elections, which means that presidential appointees would wind up running presidential elections, right? Barack Obama's people would have been in charge of Barack Obama's re-election. Donald Trump's people would be in charge of Donald Trump's re-election, right? The Electoral College pushes that power out of Washington, D.C., down into the states. States run elections. States are in charge. It's distributed, no one state controls the outcome. Instead, it's up to 51 different jurisdictions to run that election. There's a mechanism for what happens if it's too close to call in a particular state, not if it's too close to call across the country. This would create, quite simply, chaos. And it would throw any election like that, and I think that it would be far more common that you would have these sorts of elections to the courts. The stakes are enormously high. And so we would have litigation after such disputed elections, which would go on for months or even years. Meanwhile, the country would not have a president. The president is essentially the foreign policy representative of the nation. And so if you have an ongoing problem and other countries rely upon our decisions in terms of making their own decisions, so delays on who will be making policy, the uncertainty of it, would be potentially disastrous in terms of how other nations respond to America's presence in the world. It would have ripple effects throughout the globe. This will be catastrophic if we go months, let alone potentially years, with court battles. Who imagines today, with the divisions that we have in the United States, that either side is gonna capitulate and just say, okay, you win, we'll lay down our swords, we'll stop fighting. Imagine what happens in the stock market. Imagine what happens in the economy. What kind of a situation are we asking for? Well, direct popular election. Well, it sounds great. Well, it sounds very democratic also carries within it the seeds of many problems that the founders rescued us from. You know, sometimes you hear people say, well, whoever wins the popular vote should win. And if there's more people in the cities, if they win the popular vote, then that's just the way it is. And who cares about the farmers? There is no other segment of society that we would just look at them and say, your needs are unimportant. We can outvote you. We don't strive for simple, fair majorities and then just tell everybody else, tough, it doesn't matter. What we are striving for and what the Constitution sets up and what our founders wanted is justice and fairness and protection of liberty. Sometimes we hear a serious objection to the Electoral College lodged on the grounds that the Electoral College was designed by the Constitutional Convention to protect slavery. And the reasoning runs like this. The Electoral College is composed of representatives from every state based on your number of members in the House of Representatives and your number of senators. Well, isn't that a revelation? Because in that case, that means that for the purpose of representation, southern states 
could count their slaves, slaves who otherwise were not permitted any voice in the political process, towards their representatives, and those representatives would therefore pile up in the Electoral College, and there would be an artificial bonus given to slaveholding states to cast votes in favor of pro-slavery policies, and thus the Electoral College designed to operate by the Constitutional Convention for the interests of slavery. And a great aha moment erupts at that point. The difficulty is that it is an aha moment with no air in the balloon. In 1787, all of the states, not just the southern states, excepting alone Massachusetts, legalized slavery. There was no bonus paid by the Electoral College to slave-owning states versus free states. All the states enjoyed that bonus. The largest slaveholding state in the Union in 1787 was Virginia. The largest northern slaveholding state, New York. The three-fifths compromise is not created for the Electoral College. It is created for the House of Representatives. The founders need to figure out how do you represent the people and the states. Well, already built into the system is the representation for the House, the representation for the Senate. All they do is say, that math has already been vetted. It has already been through the compromise. The North is agreeing with it. The South agrees with the West and the East agree with it. We agree with that. That is the great compromise. We will build that into the presidency. When the Electoral College is finally determined upon as a mechanism for electing the president, the question of slavery never entered into the consideration because it wouldn't have had any application. There was no Electoral College advantage for slaveholding states because in 1787 they were all slaveholding states. 25 years later, that's going to change as northern states one by one move into the non-slaveholding column. But the members of the Constitutional Convention weren't writing the Constitution with a view towards saying, aha, 25 years from now, we know that there will be a bonus for slaveholding states in the Electoral College. Well, yes, there was, but it was a temporary one. It was already ebbing away by the time Abraham Lincoln is elected. Proponents of that argument have decided that if they tarnish the institution of the Electoral College with racism, then that automatically means it is suspect and needs to be replaced. But it's just ahistorical, it's not accurate, and it's not really honest, frankly. Charging the Electoral College as an institution for slavery really delegitimizes the plight of African Americans for generations. But it also completely ignores history. If you look at the kinds of people that were advancing the causes, what did people like Frederick Douglass say? They said that ultimately these systems actually were helping bring about the freedom of slaves, that they were resulting in the ability for slaves to overcome their oppressors in the South. Yes, nobody can argue that some of the founders had slaves. Some of them didn't. Slavery was very common in our world. It was wrong. But it was the United States of America that actually created a system that ultimately resulted in it being eradicated. And so now, guess what? People that look like me aren't considered three-fifths of a human being. People that look like me have the ability to vote. Black people are now fully vested members of society in spite of the inequalities that we still face today. When we're talking about do you have the right to vote, the Electoral College has no bearing on that. So for example, if you think about it, there's about 130 million people that voted in the last presidential election. Of that 130 million, the number is about 30, 35 million minorities. If you move to a system where you eliminate the Electoral College, literally the United States of America could be won at one time by just white people. That's hardly a system that promotes the diversity that exists, not just among races, not just among preferences about what partners people want to have, but also in careers and how people want to make their living. The Electoral College forces people to sort of make the compromises necessary to not just appeal to a couple of, of big blocks, but to take into account these smaller blocks of voters. I mean, that's very similar to a point that Vernon Jordan was making in the late 1970s. The Electoral College ensures that racial minorities have representation by being sort of the tipping point in a number of states and are able to influence which direction that state's electoral votes go. What purpose would there be for a candidate to appeal to 
the interests of African American voters. If in a national popular vote, African American voters amount to only 7% of those casting votes. Not really all that significant, so you pay no attention to African American voters. In the electoral college system, you do have to pay attention to African American voters because in a number of key swing states, African American voters are an important component of the voting public and you had better have something important to say for African American voters to hear or you lose their votes, when you lose their votes, you lose that state, you lose that swing state, you lose the electoral college. If you're a candidate for president, it is impossible to get elected president without black people voting for you. Now you can say the Republicans have won elections, but they have found ways to get black people to vote for them. Not a lot, but enough, right? You cannot get elected president of the United States without support in the Latino community. You can say, well, Republicans haven't gotten a lot of Latino support, but guess what? They have gotten enough. And so when you take away the electoral college, you create a scenario where people can get elected president of the United States without a single vote cast in their name by a single minority. That is the reality that we need to be facing. So if you're sitting here saying that it is right for someone to get elected who hates minorities abjectly and concretely, well then you should be terrified of an America that does not have an electoral college. The legacy of black people in America is well documented. We've had times in America when we have no rights. We have even modern day society when many of the rights that we should enjoy freely still seem as if they come with strings attached. So that is a very serious thing that we should, number one, acknowledge, and number two, still confront in our regular lives when it comes to, again, building a more perfect America. But when you talk about how do we get to that more perfect union, how do we make sure that we are living Dr. King's dream, that all people are judged by the content of their character? You don't do it by, again, getting rid of the one thing that has empowered black people to be able to leverage political power. We can have arguments about are there presidents who are hostile to the interests of certain communities. You know, what we're not talking about is a scenario where somebody who got 18% of the vote um, ends up becoming president of the United States. But we have never had a president in the modern era who has campaigned to take away rights of Americans, actually rights enshrined in the Constitution. That is a scenario that we could end up confronting in a world where we have gotten rid of the Electoral College. In the election of 1860, we had three separate parties, four if you count the Splinter Party. The candidate who won that election did not win a majority in the popular vote. The candidate of the Republican Party, in that case, actually won only 39.9% of the popular vote. Yet, that candidate won a significant majority in the Electoral College. And so, that candidate was duly elected President of the United States. Now, you might say, yes, but it wasn't a popular election. Yes, that candidate wasn't elected by all the people. That's right, that candidate wasn't. But, his name was Abraham Lincoln. There is no Emancipation Proclamation without the Electoral College, because without the Electoral College, there is no Abraham Lincoln as President of the United States of America. And while his total percentage was the lowest of any elected president, he was actually the most popular sort of national candidate to the extent we had one in that election in which the country was very divided. Lincoln was the candidate who won in New England, he won in the Mid-Atlantic states, he won in the Midwest, he won in the Prairie, he won in the new states on the West Coast. He was the most national candidate of the group, and we were very fortunate at that point that the Electoral College had given us Lincoln rather than Stephen Douglas or candidate of the Deep South slaveholders, John Breckinridge. The question for black Americans, the questions for minority communities should be, how do we get more boxes checked? How do we get to a point where both parties are now accountable and responsible? because that is how you ultimately get to a place where the solutions for black and brown people all across this great land start to accelerate. And that should happen irrespective of who's in power. The founding ethos of the Black Congressional Caucus, whether you're a Democrat or not, was that black people have no permanent friends and they have no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. And black people in America have made permanent friends of the Democratic Party, permanent enemies of the Republican Party, and our permanent interests have been cast aside. And so, if you're really, truly focused on empowering black communities,
Let's not sit here and talk about eliminating the Electoral College. Let's really focus on how do we as people leverage the power that we have in mass, in numbers, and by law, and part of that is through the Electoral College. I hear Americans saying this nowadays, and there's a lot of it going around. They, they talk about a dysfunctional government be, be, because there's disagreement, and, 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 they, and the framers would have said yes. That's exactly the way we set it up. We, we wanted this to be power, uh, contradicting power. Uh, unless Americans can appreciate that and learn, learn to love the separation of powers, which means learning to love the gridlock which the framers believed would be the main protection of minorities, the main protection. If, if a bill is about to pass that really comes down hard on some minority, they think it's terribly unfair, it doesn't take much to throw a monkey wrench into, into, this, into this complex system. So Americans should, uh, should appreciate that, and, and they should learn to love the gridlock. The Constitution, if properly understood, is just one big balancing act. We've got states balanced against the national government. We've got the states balanced against each other. We've got the, each branch of government, judiciary, executive, legislative, balancing each other. We've got presidential vetoes and supermajority requirements to amend the Constitution, and we have the Electoral College. And all of these different aspects of our Constitution just is a big, careful balance to protect our liberty. We're constantly trying to make things better. So the fact they may not have gotten it right you by your lights 200 years ago is precisely why you want to keep this system because it allows you to make those kind of changes that you think are needed. So if you want to control over your life, have a more opportunity in your life, you got to go with this one and uh, try to perfect this one and not go to the demagogues who have their own agenda, which is not your well-being. So we have to be very careful when we try to fiddle around with a system that has worked so well for this country over so many years and has, in each case, with a very small number of exceptions, has produced a president who got the most popular votes. It is very likely that unless Electoral College defenders rise up and defend the system that's in our Constitution and make the argument about why the Electoral College is so important, we could easily lose the Electoral College. This is close to happening and, and could easily happen within the next few years. If you change how presidential elections work, you essentially nullify the constitutional process, rip state lines up from presidential elections, and create this environment where huge swaths of America could just be left behind. The founder's solution, the solution that over the course of American history might, we can say, is, is imperfect, but has been remarkably successful in the model of the whole world is precisely this balancing very carefully by using checks and balances and in institutional systems and structures like the Electoral College to have majority rule and, and the rights of the individuals secure. And that thing is what gives rise to this idea we call liberty, which is so unusual in world history and anywhere else in the world and we have it precisely because of those institutions, which you oftentimes take for granted. We can't do that because if you lose that balance, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to recover. The founders knew that, which is why they spent so much time on this question, and why they saw what they were doing as the equivalent of founding. They're trying to solve a, a deeply human, uh, eternal problem of how we govern ourselves and they create a beautiful system which should be preserved.